Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Meta Cafe. You know, good morning, Alexandra. You are a new person for us. I love that. Thank you for joining us. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, I'm feeling like a, a scattered professor this morning, right? That like my hair won't do what I want it to do. I've had it up, down, up, down, up, down 10 times. Now I have these little wispies in front of my face. That's going to drive me crazy. I had all of these pieces of paper that I was getting ready to, to pass, you know, information on and nothing was coming together. And then I went, oh my gosh, I get it, right? None of this is coming together this morning because Saturn has changed directions and it is now moving direct. It started this morning at, I want to say it was like two in the morning. Yeah, 2.10 a.m. Pacific time. So when the planet Saturn changes direction, it's one of our, it's our bigger, you know, the bigger planet. It's karma. It is all of the duty and responsibility, all the lessons that we have to learn. And all of it comes, you know, crashing into a halt and changing direction. Uh, is it any wonder we feel a little weird this morning, right? A little scattered, a little unsure of what to what comes next. So imagine my surprise this morning when I woke up. I woke up really early. It was about a quarter to six, maybe. And I, I get up and I'm getting ready to go about my day. My husband looks at me, goes, what are you doing up so early? And I'm like, I don't know. I'm excited for the day, I guess. And then I pick up, I first of all, I can't find my phone. And it's the first thing I do every morning. I get up and I look at my phone. I look through, seeing if there's messages, anything I have to take action on before I start my day rolling. And I couldn't find my freaking phone. I don't know. I know where it was last night because it was sitting next to me at some point. I was texting uh, uh, a friend last night, but I couldn't find my phone. I went all over the house. Then my husband's sitting there trying to dial my phone and it won't ring. He can't get a signal. And I'm like, oh, this is weird, right? This is weird. And then uh, we finally find my phone by moving everything around where I had been sitting last night. <laughs> and it was sitting there right underneath my Kindle. It just didn't look like my Kindle was raised up by the, you know, length of, by the, the depth of my phone. So I was having a conniption fit for nothing, right? So I find my phone and then there in my phone, it says no service. I have no service, no service across the top and the wireless is on. So I should have signal because I have wireless I, as a backup because I live on this island and I often don't have, you know, really good cell service. So I have backup wireless. Well, it turns out my wireless was off. I had no signal this morning. I had no signal. I had no game. If I have no signal, I have no game, right? I have, I can't do what I do. And so I'm freaking out, right? I call the company and I'm thinking, how am I going to get a cell signal, right? Because I have no signal to make a phone call and I have no internet to make a phone call on the wireless and my home phones, I turn off, which I forgot to do. So chances are, it's going to ring. I for, uh, I turn them off and then I forget to turn them back on and the phones die. So, I mean, I'm like freaking out this morning. There's just like no way I can do my day if I don't have internet. When I call the cable company, it said, it appears that you've forgotten to make the payment and your service has been interrupted. And I went, are you bleeping kidding me? So then I'm thinking back to when was the last time I made that payment? And I couldn't remember when the last time was that I made that payment. And sure enough, uh, and of course, at that point in the morning, there's nothing I can do about it. Uh, in fact, their their customer service center doesn't open until 7 a.m. And I'm calling at 615 looking for my, where's my service? Where's my, <laughs> where's my signal? Where's my game? It was too funny. And I felt familiar feelings. And here's where it becomes key for all of you is that in the moment, in the moment, of all of this sort of seeming chaos, I heard an old tape running in my head, you know, from past years where money has been an issue or where I wasn't able to pay the bills because we didn't have the money and my electricity was being disconnected. And then, you know, the water would get disconnected or then the cable, the telephone, the service, you know, the, the internet would get disconnected where, 
uh, just, you know, struggles financially. And so I immediately felt myself going back. I was being pulled back into that old fear. That is how powerful fear is in our stream. And we've been talking about the veil of fear that surrounds our life here on this planet and that it seems to be our default setting. And my default setting was, oh my God, if I can't do my job, then I'm going to have to go out and get a job. I mean, literally people, this is, <laughs> I, I started blowing up. I started blowing up or maybe imploding um, with the mind chatter. Now I hadn't taken any action on anything, nothing, right? I just, other than trying to call the company and get that settled. And, and it was a testament to the fact that I've been working on myself for these last years to be able to hold my center while seemingly my life was crumbling around around me, or at least that was the story. The story that was I was telling myself is, oh no, you know, your life is over. And if you don't have a cell signal or you don't have internet, you have no game. You can't do your job. You can't go on air this morning. You can't do this. You can't do that. And if I have to take the money to pay for that, then the, uh, well, mm. Old tapes, the power of the old tapes. And I'll tell you what I did. The only thing I could do is I listened. I listened. I allowed the tape to run. And then I I just paused and I said, well, I'm going to come back to center. I'm going to come back to center because it's 6.15 in the morning and I'm not going to let this ruin my day. And there's nothing I can do about it anyway until 7 o'clock when their office opens. So what could I do in the meantime? Well, instead of crumbling up and crying or doing whatever, throwing a tantrum, I got myself ready. I got myself ready. And then I started, um, you know, looking at the things I was going to share with everybody this morning. And then it hit me. Saturn turned direct at 2 a.m. my time. So 5 a.m. Uh, 2 a.m. my time would be 5 a.m., 5, 10 a.m. East Coast time. So early, early in the day, the planet of karma, the, the great teacher um, turned from retrograde motion where the things that we've been working on have been more internal and now becomes the external picture of what those things are that you've been working on. It was so in my face that I almost didn't see it. I could have almost missed it. I could have almost missed that for the last four months, we've been working on fears. We've been working on how do we deal with these things in our lives. And then immediately I'm faced with that issue the day that Saturn turns direct and the old tapes kick in. But here's the testament to doing the work is that I recognized it when it was happening. You can recognize it when it's happening. And you don't have to become the victim. I refused to go back to victim energy, even though I wanted to. Oh, my Lord, it was so prevalent there. I just wanted to like, okay, God, if you want me to do all this work, how am I supposed to do that without internet? And blah, 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 right? I really, really was going there. And I just stopped. And thankfully, my husband did not get pulled into the drama with me because then two of us in the drama, I told you I forgot to turn the phone off and it's going to ring. And... uh I have no idea what that is, but at any rate, we'll keep talking and hopefully it'll shut itself off here in a minute. Uh, so the testament to the power of doing the work when the planets are retrograde, it's on the internal and on the external then when the planet changes direction. So what can we expect then of this time period now that Saturn is in full on forward motion? That's what everybody wants to know, right? Let me see what people are saying here. It's supposed to go to voicemail after the fourth ring and it's not doing that. So, sorry. Um, well, that takes care of that. Okay, so. All right, I apologize. Okay, so let's go back to what is it that Saturn might mean for us now that we are in forward motion. Now that we're in forward motion. So 
Saturn turned direct at two degrees of Capricorn. So I went to one of my old favorite books. Did I leave it out here? This is an old book, right? It's like yellowed and uh, the pages are dog-eared because I could only get it used. But it's Dane Rudier's Astrological Mandala. And essentially he mm -hmm. takes the information like from the, um, the uh, what do they call it? Sabian symbols. And he turns it into a uh, sort of a mandala mm -hmm. of the 360 degrees of the Zodiac wheel. And what is the meaning of each of those degrees? And there's a story behind that. It was, you know, a, uh, they, they had a channel who actually, you know, tuned in and sort of channeled the information about what each one of those degrees meant. And at two degrees Capricorn, what it was, is a strong desire to prove oneself, a yearning for new experiences. And Saturn then, as it changes directions on that degree, is bringing us then the building blocks of new experiences. I think I sort of embodied that this morning, new experience. What was it like to be able to have the command over my own mind chattering at me and, you know, dragging me back into this old way of being? And it was absolutely, in retrospect, it was fabulous, right? A fabulous testament. And it was so small. It really, in the grand scheme of things, it's not like someone called me and told me I was going to die tomorrow. Um, it, it wasn't, it wasn't like that, but there was something that triggered in me that old fear and I could feel it almost in every, every cell of my body was in resonance with that fear at one point. And I was able to stay as conscious as I could during that moment and not make mistakes, not make decisions based on old tapes. It was fantastic, right? So here's our opportunity. Saturn, the... <laughs> You know, he is, he's the, he was the last planet actually in the ancient path pantheon. And he really represented that coming home of all of the energy. Remember, you know, way back uh, in the early days of astrology before the 1700s, when we didn't know there was Uranus out there, because after Saturn comes Uranus. And so without it, um, without Uranus, everything ended at uh, Saturn. So we had Saturn and then the inner planets that they worked with. And those are the seven that really showed us what, who we were and what we were here to do. So Saturn, even though we have these other planets now, really was the stopping point. It was like the stop code on, on your DNA. And everything else that came along afterwards added light, added more and more light to the DNA to the vital part of who we are. And so Saturn never loses its place and its importance. He actually is anchoring for us the idea of the buck stops here, right? The buck stops here. That you are always in control and always in responsibility to what is going on in your outer world. It's really pretty cool. And just today, then I looked up to see what are all the Saturn, you know, I could have done a chart for Saturn uh, direct just to see what that would mean. But I looked instead at all the different planets that were affecting Saturn today. Like what were the aspects, right? And the aspects he's in a, tr to, this is the beginning of the grand earth trine between Saturn, Uranus and Mercury. So we have this information flowing through us right now, grounding in a new reality, grounding in a new structure for us to live our lives, right? If we need to release fear, then we have to have a new structure that's going to be able to hold our ability to move through that and, and live our lives on our terms as opposed to through the veil of fear. I'm going to stop for a second and see what people say here. So did we have to work in in Uranus into astrology when we discovered it. Sounds like I woke up today. Let's see. Oh my God, old tapes running for me for three days. <laughs> um, good morning, Kristen. Good morning, Suzanne. Good morning, Asa. Good morning, Mimi. Yes, she, Mimi. Mimi is almost encapsulating what I was feeling here. Namaste. I mean, no, that's sorry. April, that, that was Asa. But yes, feeling scattered yet will plug forward. Um, anytime a planet that big changes direction, even though it's not literally changing direction, we feel sort of the backwash of it. 
right? We feel that backwash and it disturbs the energy, right? Fields of energy, they're flowing, or they may, they may have, you know, a certain frequency and then a planet changes direction and it disturbs that frequency. What do they call that? Interference. Interference wave patterns begin to develop and we feel it. We absolutely feel it. So let me answer Suzanne's question here that she asked about um, working Uranus into our astrology. So here's the deal. Anytime a new planet is discovered, and this is happening all the time now, you might notice like every other day, it seems like astronomers are finding a new planet in a new system, uh, a new uh, uh, asteroid or body that, you know, even astrologers are working with, Ceres, Pallas, Athena, um, uh, there's Sedna, there's Qualyar, there's, I mean, so many, right? I can't even use them all. But as they get discovered, then they enter into the stream of consciousness here on the planet. So at the point Uranus came in, a rather powerful awakening was rippling through humanity, was rippling through the planet. It was the birth of technology, the, the mechanized age, and how that mechaniz me uh, mechanization changed everything, right? How it changed everything. So Uranus entering into the conversation at that point in time created a huge awakening in the possibilities in inventions and in technology. And I mean, look at all, you know, after Uranus, there was the, you know, the, the telephone and the cars and electricity and uh, uh, all of the bases for the life we live right now happened at the point that, or after the point that Uranus enters into the conversation. Same thing happens when, you know, Chiron bursts onto the scene in 1978. And Chiron bursting into the scene brings the wound up to the surface. And now we all are dealing with what it is the wound is about. We have that in our conversation because it wasn't available to us before that point in time. And that's why when I do readings for people that are, you know, born in the uh, earlier 70s and early in the 60s or the 50s, or even sometimes I do them for people in the late 40s, um, Chiron wasn't a part of the conversation. I was 17 years old when Chiron entered into conversation. It wasn't available to me before that. Does that mean I wasn't wounded before that? No. The wound was always there. It just got triggered at the point that it busts into our awareness, into our consciousness. It's like when you get a new car, right? You get a new car and Everywhere you go, you see people that are driving that same car, maybe that same color. And before that, you didn't notice that car that much. It is the, in the reptilian brain, I believe it's, the, it's or maybe it's in the amygdala. It's called the reticular activating, reticular activating system within the brain that begins to have that where awareness dawns, where there's this recognition of something and you keep seeing it in your outer world it's become activated within you. So as each planet becomes part of the, the pantheon or becomes part of our awareness, it becomes more and more activated within us. Does that make sense to everybody? I hope so. Uh, Suzanne says, okay, wow, love it. Um, so I don't even know how we got on this conversation and I'm sorry, I'm I'm feeling so scattered. I've got people calling me saying urgent. I've got telephones ringing over here. It's just driving me crazy. I should just maybe turn, put my phone down so I don't see it. Um, <laughs> tells you when my phone starts doing this and people are calling out for help, um, it tells me a planet. I mean, I, if I didn't even know astrology, I would know a planet's changed direction because it is affecting not just me, but everyone. So we have the grand trine in earth and earth means what practical application of principles of steps, actionable steps. Now that Saturn is in forward motion, we have more um, available energy for us to move forward. Right. Remember all summer long, we had the summer of retrogrades at one point about eight bodies in retrograde motion. And it seemed like everywhere we went, we were hitting roadblocks or we were, you know, just having to relax and just go with the flow. Um, now with Saturn moving direct and Pluto moving direct later this month, we have like this motion now telling us to move forward with our plans, move forward with those goals. 
right? You've had enough of the internal shifting, and now you're going to have to test those shifts on the inner world out in the outer world. Tests, if you will, right? I, I had a test this morning, right? My patience was tested. My old tapes running were tested. Um, it, I can't even tell you the experience that I had. And it was such a small one, but so impactful in so many ways, right? So be looking for that in your own life. These are your opportunities for growth, right? So, and it is about how we're going to ground this change into the planet. You guys are light workers. You wouldn't be here in, in my world if you weren't a, a light worker. A light worker, meaning it is your job to bring more and more light into your DNA, into this reality, grounding it into this planet. That's your job. And in whatever way you do that, some of you may be doing that by working with kids. Some of you may be doing that by doing, you know, astrology or readings for people or healing or through art or through dance, through writing, whatever way it is, it is your job <laughs> to ground it in now. Make it so, you know, Jean-Luc Picard from Star Trek, make it so. And that's what we're here to do. Also today, Saturn in its changing of directions is in a sextile to Venus, strengthening our relationships, strengthening our working in partnership, in community. Let me just prepare you all for what happens starting with 2019. We move into a three year and the three year is expansive. It means that I can't be one and I can't be two, but I am now three. It is group dynamic right? It is more about the community and how we express joy together and how do we create together? How do we become co-creators? That's what's coming up for us in 2019. And of course, different planets doing different things, but the flavor of the year, and we're already September, October, November. So we are close to the dawning of that energy already, right? Because October, November, December, usually about three months before the new energy is when you begin to feel it. So I'm just giving you that now because one of the things that we are working through is aligning ourselves with our values and attracting then like-minded people. You know, those like-minded people that, that form your community, that form your relationships, your business partnerships, your business groupings, right? That's kind of the new energy that Saturn is bringing to us now with Venus. And in no small way, there's also little Pallas Athena. I had a conversation with someone else yet the other day about Pallas because she is so, I mean, she's burst into the scene. She's already there, but now she's, she's like in my consciousness. And I don't know why she would be in my consciousness if it wasn't for me to share that with you. So she's now in your consciousness and she is really calling us to become, to come into an equilibrium. We're going to be talking about that again in a minute an equilibrium where masculine and feminine energy are in equal parts, in balance, in a harmony. And by the way, total equilibrium is, uh, is never achievable, right? We can come into equilibrium, but as soon as a, a, a situation changes or an energy shifts, it takes it and pulls it out of equilibrium, right? A, equilibrium is static. So the, 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 the key to equilibrium is how do we come back to that equilibrium when something like a planet washes by us and changes direction and upsets us, right? How do we come back to that equilibrium? So thing equilibrium is a noble gift. It is a noble gift, but it is inherently unstable because there's always going to be stuff that happens that can change equilibrium. It's how you come back to that. It's how you create harmony from that. All right. So Pallas Athena, how do we bring those parts of ourselves together in a way that creates harmony so that we are firing on all of our thrusters? That the masculine part of you is as powerful as the feminine part of you. And if you're a man, that the feminine part of you is as strong as that masculine part of you. 
because in balance, they create beauty and harmony. And we're going to see something interesting about that here in just a minute. Before I go to the gift of equilibrium in uh, our exploration of the gene keys, I want to say one last thing today. Um, uh, yin and yang. Yes, Suzanne, you're right. Uh, good morning, Michelle Brooks. Good to see you. Uh, anybody else I've missed? I'm sorry. Uh, good morning to all of you again. Um, it's just been one of those mornings. So Jupiter and Pluto are in a very interesting dance with one another right now. They're in a sextile relationship. Sextile is a 60 degree angle and it connotes a sharing of the gifts and talents that both planets bring, right? Jupiter, the gift of expansion and growth and Pluto, the gift of power, power empowerment. And together they're often thought of in wealth creation. So when you have Jupiter and, and Pluto in a powerful combination in your own chart, abundance and wealth creation happens. And it's often Pluto in someone's chart that really, uh, where Pluto is, can really tell you what their um, wealth factor might be, like what's their natural wealth setting. And if it's, for example, in the second house, there may be a, a wealth setting that's down here. And a part of their life is going to be about bringing up that. Um, I'm broadcasting right now. I'll call you back. Bye. Sorry. So if we have this setting that's down here, then the, the, the planet Pluto then comes along with Jupiter to help you elevate that setting, right? to bring it up, to make it higher or to make it stronger, or to empower it in some way. Makes sense, right? So we have right now Jupiter and Scorpio. Jupiter in, is in Pluto's sign. So Jupiter's empowering Pl Pluto, and Pluto's empowering Jupiter. So we really are supporting, we have support out there for this transformation to abundance. And we talked about, remember a few, maybe last week sometime, we talked about the idea of wealth and wealth and abundance and how, um, how the wealth creation, the concept of wealth often takes us to, you know, how much is too much, right? If you're a billionaire and you're sitting on billions of dollars, is that really the best use of resources? Right. And so the universe often brings you the exact amount of wealth that you need in order to do the work that you're doing. Anything other than that, it becomes a fear based thing. Right. The billionaire who's sitting on billions because he's afraid to spend the money because of what it might mean in terms of his power loss or his status loss or anything like that. It's fear. And the other side of the coin, when you don't have enough money, now it's a fear of lack, not having enough, not being able to feed myself, pay my power bill, pay my rent, pay my house payments, et cetera, et cetera. So there's this flow of abundance that we need to establish where it is enough for what it is that we want to do with our lives. So in a way, if you know, you have these big dreams and these big things that you want to get done, your wealth factor, if you will, might be higher than someone who, whose aspirations are just enough to be able to live a comfortable life. So Jupiter and Pluto right now coming together in a way to really solidify that for us, right? If you have this big dream and that's what you're working toward, your wealth level needs to be moving up in order to be able to run that. And, and I'm, and it's not that that person's dream is any better than this person over here who just wants to be able to take care of their family and have them fed, clothed and everything they need whenever they want it. There's nothing wrong with that, right? The universe tends to provide just enough and a little more than what you need. And here we have that, supporting this transformation to abundance, whatever that means for you personally. But you've got to step out of your own way. Right? Thrusters, Star Trek. Yes, yes. I'm a Trekkie. A Trekkie from way back. I mean, I, yeah. Anyway, there's just something about Star Trek. And actually, there's just something about uh, William Shatner and uh, 
what is the guy's name that plays Jean-Luc Picard? Uh, I'll think of his name. Uh, he, two gorgeous men that, you know, played this wonderful role. So now I'm going to shift gears a bit. Let me see any others, anybody, any questions from people? Anybody have, yeah, you too, yay. Um, okay, so if you have questions, go ahead and type them in there. But now I want to talk a little bit about the 50th Gene Key. By the way, I drew a card. So somebody yell at me if I go to hang up today without the card, okay? Because it was important. It was, it blew me away. So today we're going to shift a little into the gift of equilibrium. And in all honesty, I'm not going to be able to do this justice this morning, mostly because I was dealing with so much this morning on my own and I feel scattered and this really deserves to have a focused um, conversation, but I'm going to open us up to this conversation and then maybe we'll pick it up tomorrow and run with it. Okay. So first of all, I want to show you where the 50th gene key 50th gate is. So I'm going to get my little model. And I think I did show it to you actually the other day. It sits right here at the point, right? There's, you can't really see it, but it says 50. Maybe you can see it. Maybe I just can't see it. <laughs> so here's the 50, uh, 50, gate 50 or gene key 50. They're interchangeable words or terms. And you see it sitting on the spleen center and it has a channel that connects it over to the sacral. So when it connects to the sacral, it becomes um, attached to a power center or to a, a, an engine, if you will. But today it's just hanging here. Actually, the whole thing is completed if I tell the truth here, because gate 27 is where Uranus is sitting. So this whole channel is, is defined for us right now. So that's another conversation for another day. But if we look at this particular piece here, this is tribal energy. It is part of the tribal circuitry. New term for you maybe with the, within uh, human design, but human design is made up of circuits. Just like a, a, a motherboard in your computer is made up of circuitry, you also are energetically made up of circuits. Circuits that flow energy in specific ways or patterns. This particular circuit is part of the tribal circuitry. And it is the feminine side of the tribal circuitry, where over here, from gate 59 over to the emotional center at gate 6, is the masculine side of the circuitry. So we have the gate 50 and the gate 27 in the feminine, and gate 59 and gate 6, which happens to be the gate of intimacy, in the masculine side of the channel. It's kind of funny, right? So gate 50, the gift, really holds the blueprint uh, for equilibrium, while the 59th gene key on the other side um, is the implementer of equilibrium. So let's talk about that for a minute. So in human design, what we see at gate 50 in the feminine part of that circuit is that it is the feminine energy that that sets what the values are for the tribe, that creates the laws for the tribe, the rules, the regulations, et cetera, et cetera, right? It is the feminine energy that says, this is what will be. It is the masculine energy at gate 59 that implements the feminine's laws. That is how we're designed right? It is the feminine energy that says our children will be fed, our children will be clothed, our older people will be taken care of, health will be taken care of, full pantries. That's the feminine. It is up to the masculine then to take that energy and make it so. Jean-Luc Picard makes it so, right? So it is the masculine energy that goes out there and does the protection of the values of the tribe. It is the masculine that goes out there and implements the laws or the rules that are going to support the feminine values of the tribe, the tribe, the community, the family, the whatever. It's like when you were a kid and or me, so some of you who are older when you were a kid and your mom says, wait till your dad gets home, right? Because you're going to break the rules, the values of the family. It's going to be your dad that is going to do the disciplining. Right. So 
in some ways, even though some people might think that sounds sexist, in some ways, the implementation of the laws was being taken out or taken care of by the dad, the masculine, right? Mama said, make this happen and it happens or there's hell to pay in the family, right? In our communities, it's been turned upside down. We have these people in politics uh, that are creating these laws and these things that aren't in support of, it's like, uh, is it any wonder our, our, our systems are in chaos? Because it isn't the feminine that's placing out there what the values are. It is in some ways very masculine efforts out there that put our values, that have skewed our values. And I'm not saying that it's men that are at fault. Please don't take it that way. Because in, in no small way, women have given it up, right? We've given up the power. We haven't demanded that this is the way it's going to be. Go out and do it, right? So these two, masculine and feminine, have to work in a balance and an equilibrium in order to make the flow of energy work in the support of a species, of the species, our species. Does that make sense to everybody? <laughs> Suzanne, I just love you. She says, can't I, can I just say how much I love human design? I need to do charts for everyone I know. <laughs> and you know where you can get those charts. Um, you can actually even get a human design program yourself for free, a free version of a human design program so that you can do that Shh, secret. Don't, you know, you don't necessarily need me to get you the charts. You can get the program yourself. It's definitely possible. Okay, so, so what we have then in the 50th gift of equilibrium is the masculine and the feminine in their right places doing their right jobs, their right energies. And so this is in interpersonal relationships, right? Now, if we look at the relationship of equilibrium to the social fabric, then what we see is that the blueprint for equilibrium is predicated on honesty. Honesty in our interactions with others is needed in order to increase the frequency to get us through that fear veil in order to rise the en raise the energy from the level of the fear to the level of the gift and to the city. Right? The fear in this gate was corruption or the shadow here was corruption where the information coming in is being filtered by a, a, a shadow a fear of, of what it, and then the energy gets corrupted when it gets to us. The information is corrupted. So here we have the role. What is the role of honesty in a group? Well, first of all, to create honesty in a group, you need transparency. Can you imagine, just imagine this for a minute, just imagine if the president of the United States or of any country, any politician came clean and just said, these are all the things I did, you know, it wasn't pretty. And instead of de deflecting and blaming and, you know, casting aspersions and all the stuff that that we as humans do to others when we're trying to be dishonest, <laughs> honesty would say taking responsibility begins with reeling it in. This is what I've done. It, and, you know, this is the reason why being honest with myself, I was afraid that you wouldn't like me for who I am. I was afraid so there's got to be a level of transparency and honesty that comes up in which all hidden agendas are also out in the open. What is the hidden agenda of the social right, of the, what do they call them? The right wing, the conser conservation conservatives. What is the agenda of the liberals? What is the agenda? Because before you can have any healthy group, 
that big or, you know, even your own groups where you might be part of the PTA or you might be part of a, a, a board for your kids in sports or you may be doing, you know, other community work out there with people before a group can come to an equilibrium where corruption can't happen, the aura of the whole group has to be clean. All the hidden agendas out there on the table. Transparency. So if you're starting a group and you're, you're, you know, your main reason for starting the group is to generate funds for, you know, this over here, but you're telling people, yay, we're going to get together and we're going to do all this stuff and we're going to earn money and we're going to put it over there. But really what your agenda is that it's going over here. Problem. That's a problem because there's not an equilibrium there. There's not an honesty. The group dynamic is already being corrupted. So the gift of equilibrium really takes us into this idea of the group as a whole having a clean aura, being on an equilibrium, an equal footing with one another without the hierarchy that comes from the corrupted entered the corrupted information and tomorrow I'm going to take you because I've this next piece I have to work with myself and it's this concept of a hierarchy a hierarchy so a hierarchy places individual equilibrium before all else I got to I got to work this one through before I can actually present what that might mean for all of us. But Richard Rudd always throws out these really interesting words, synarchy, um, heterarchy. Um, and, I, and I love that because it gives us new ways of playing in the world. Remember, words come before manifestation. So if we don't have a word or a word that we can put a concept to, then it can't be so. So now we're going to empower ourselves by bringing in this new word. And then we're going to put some energy around this word, heterarchy, instead of hierarchy. It already sounds better, doesn't it? Heterarchy. Hetero meaning balanced, maybe? I don't know. Well, we'll tear the word apart tomorrow. And we'll look at that in a deeper way, as well as looking at the gift of harmony, because one leads to the other. There we have it. So let's look at the card that I drew this morning. Wisdom of the Oracle, of course, my favorite deck by Colette Baron reed Lovely, lovely lady. So the card I drew literally jumped out from the deck, and it's one that I don't think we've had before. And I drew it upside down. So it's in protection mode. And it was the truth be told card, card 14. So we see the picture of an owl here, right? Truth and honesty, truth be told. And in protection, upside down. So let's see what the meaning of the card is. We can guess. Um, the essential meaning is about honesty, accepting things at face value, coming out of denial, and the willingness to be transparent, clarity of communication. You know, sometimes I wish that I do this card pull right in front of you so you could see that I, I don't, I can't make this up. Literally, I would have had to go through the deck to find a card uh, that matched what it is that we're talking about here today, about transparency, about honesty, about clarity, all these things. So interesting that the card pops out of the deck at me in response to what this energy is all about. So the, the protection message, where are you being dishonest with yourself or others? If you're unhappy in, er in, in any area of your life, look for signs of denial. This can also pertain to others being misleading or withholding or acting from hidden agendas. Now is the time to say no to dishonesty in all forms. Ask for truth. Even if you don't like what you hear, acknowledging it will be key to a beautiful new future where you no longer labor under the heavy burdens that deceit and denial impose on you. Set yourself free. Nothing less than truth is required now. Just wow. <laughs> Just wow. And do we have the right to ask that of the people who lead our nations, our countries, our communities? Hell yes. 
right? If we are going to expect that of ourselves, and apparently that's what we're being told, then we can expect that of our leaders, right? We can begin with our votes to elect people that have transparency at their core. And some of you are going to be really pessimistic and say, nobody's that transparent. Nobody's going to, you know, tell you what their hidden agenda is. Well, um, yeah, that's a possibility. But it's more possible that we can create a change on the planet if we begin with ourselves by becoming transparent within ourselves. So we can set the pathway for others to become that way by doing it for ourselves. You're never without power. You can always work on your own self. Yeah, wow on the card. So appropriate. I agree, Mimi. Just, just wow. I mean, I, I literally, this, this deck is magical. This is a magical deck. Wisdom of the Oracle by Colette Baron reed So I think I will leave you with that this morning. Um, don't feel bad if your life feels scattered today or if weird things happen. Always when a planet changes direction, that's what we deal with. Uh, but things are moving in a good direction. Just remember, you do have the power. Uh, you do have the power. You're never powerless. And the more that you become conscious and aware and become response able and release yourself from being a victim, the more power you gain and not the kind of power that takes away from others, but that builds us all up. All right. That's it for me today. Uh, thank you so much for joining me and for being patient while all these various technology things were going on this morning. Mwah! Much love to you all. See you tomorrow. Wait, tomorrow's Friday. Wow, we have a big day tomorrow too. So Friday, finally. <laughs> all right. Mwah! Much love. Bye-bye.